Right. I'm going to take you for a little wander around the area of Edge Hill, where Joseph Williamson lived. There aren't any photographs of how it looked in his day, so we've got to rely on old paintings. And some of those are not very reliable, but they're the best we can do. So here we go. This is a painting, one of many, by uh, an artist, a local Liverpool artist called uh, William Herdman. William Herdman wandered the streets of Liverpool for many years painting what he saw. A very useful uh, man of his time before photography took over. Uh, but unfortunately, there was an awful lot of artistic license involved. This is uh, a part of Mason Street in uh, Edge Hill where Joseph Williamson lived. And um, Joseph Williamson's own house is this one here, three-story Georgian house, which he put up, we believe, somewhere around 1806 or thereabouts. And uh, it's still standing, just two stories of that facade. And in fact, the two side windows there, bricked up now, are still visible in what's left of um, his house frontage. The house next door was set back about three feet so that he had two side windows looking down the street. Rather odd, but uh, everything about Williamson was odd. Here's another one. Not sure whether this is uh, by Herdman or not. I, I don't see any uh, signatures on any of the photos, uh, sorry, any of the uh, paintings, so I couldn't honestly say. But this again depicts the Williamson house, and you can quite clearly see there is an arch there at the front, which we, which we still have now. But I'm rather doubtful about whether this was actually uh, an entranceway. It's been suggested that um, there was an entranceway through to the rear of the property, where coach and horse could be driven through. But uh, I'm rather doubtful. It might have been designed that way, but I think possibly it was filled in later, at a later date. Um, you see the White House at the top there. The next slide is going to be looking at that and the cluster of Williamson buildings that stood uh, further up the street. That's this one here. And at first glance, you would assume that this was actually a mansion house. It has a crescent-shaped driveway there where the coach and horses could be driven in and out. And it looks like one large house. But in fact, I don't believe it is. I think it's actually a cluster of houses. And in fact, it's only very recently that I've seen um, a street plan of the area uh, that I'd never seen before, which appears to show that this part of the building, round to that curved area was not attached to the rest of it. And that through there, diagonally, there's a way through between the two parts of the building uh, leading through to the, uh, the land at the rear. So uh, that's new to me, probably new to all of us. And uh, it would look maybe quite different if the artist had been um, sitting further over to the left but this is what it looks like anyway from a straight on view there's another shot of it uh, it says on here mason street west side showing the old headquarters of the second lancashire artillery volunteers in 1888 i don't know whether that's deadly accurate or not i think it was being uh, assumed by us that that is true so we'll stick with it for now but you can see from there uh, on the top or standing up very tall from behind the building is a, a communications mast. And uh, so if this was occupied by the Lancashire Artillery Volunteers, I think at this time they must have been sharing it with the Royal Corps of Signals as well, who would have had this uh, mast. Here's an interesting one. This is by way of a correction. I have no idea who Mr. Wakefield is, but he's obviously an artist and he wasn't very happy with William Herdman's depiction of the uh, Mason Street area. As, as not being very accurate. And so he's drawn this uh, pencil drawing to correct the inaccuracies that um, William Herdman had um, sort of brought in by his artistic license. Now this shows the Williamson house quite clearly, and there's that archway at the front, but it doesn't appear to be 
an arch that goes through behind. And there is a front door to the right of it. Uh, after the right there is uh, the White House and then that, that cluster occupied by the territorials off to the right. Now, um, the writing's quite interesting here. Um, West side looking towards Paddington, Liverpool, showing some of Joseph Williamson's peculiar structures in 1841. The whole of this property was built by Joseph Williamson, the eccentric, eccentric king of Edge Hill. And with the exception of the White House upwards, it still stands in 1916. The mansion at the top was from 1806 to 1841, the residence of Joseph Williamson. That's not actually correct because he died in 1840. The other houses beginning at the White House and coming down being occupied respectively by William Merritt, merchant, followed by William Skerritt, gentleman, Charles Alexander, merchant, then the Reverend Dr. Raffles, who lived in the house having the tree in the front garden, that's a smaller one there. Uh, then the Reverend James Martineau next door and John Dixon Hoare or Hare and William Maxwell, merchants. So uh, that gives you an idea of who was living in the houses at the time. Um, the Reverend Dr. Raffles is an interesting character. Uh, he, he was quite a character, I believe, and uh, he uh, was obviously a tenant of Joseph Williamson, and uh, I think they probably had some interesting discussions between them, but uh, Dr. Raffles was actually the minister of the Great George Street Congregational Church uh, for over 50 years, and that's commonly known by everybody as the Blackie. Moving on to 1916, you can see how the area has deteriorated. These are still Williamson buildings, but by this time, the area has gone downhill a long way. And uh, this uh, area here is where the uh, railway cutting crosses Mason Street. And this building will be right alongside the uh, railway cutting, which is um, 60 to 80 feet deep at this point. I'm not sure whether that will be one of the Williamson buildings or not, because uh, I know for a fact that the London and Northwestern Railway um, purchased lots of properties above and either side of where their cutting was going to run um, uh, to make the job possible. And they may have uh, demolished a building that stood here and then built another one. But really, it looks as if it probably is a Williamson building. But um, as I say, the area has gone steeply downhill by this time. That's an interesting little sign that that was a company uh, called Zeph, Z-E-P-H, who were um, a clothing manufacturer, and they, I believe they were making underwear. Got a feeling we've seen a sign that says Zeph, or just about see the lettering on the, on the side of the Williamson building. But whether they occupied the Williamson building, his own house at one point, and then moved further along the street, I couldn't say. There's a slightly brightened up version of the same picture I'm throwing in just because it doesn't make it look quite so bleak, but it's still obviously gone seriously downhill. And uh, even when you uh, colorize the photo, it's still not much better. Going back up the street um, beyond Williamson's house to that cluster of mansion style buildings, this is what replaced them. The Territorial Army had occupied the Williamson buildings uh, as a barracks for a number of years, but eventually they knocked all those buildings down and they put up this uh, building, which became their barracks and headquarters. Um, and that went up between 1900 and 1903. And they also built um, a large drill hall on the land behind here. And then there was a, a parade ground behind that. Just take note of this tower, a squat little tower. Uh, it has the entranceway. Uh, through the barracks and uh, then straight into the drill hall behind. You'll maybe see that in a, a later old photograph that I'm going to throw in. Um, looking at the other side of Mason Street now, this is uh, looking north along Mason Street towards Paddington. And as you can see, the area is really going downhill. I don't know what year this is, but um, things have changed dramatically since um, the posh houses of Williamson's day. And uh, now another one looking in the opposite direction. This is on the east side of Mason Street again, 
opposite side from Williamson's uh, houses. And this is looking down towards um, Grinfield Street at the other end. Going around the corner uh, along Mason Street and then turning up Paddington, um, this is all we have by way of um, uh, a look at what the Williamson commercial buildings looked like at the top of Paddington. There are no photographs of this shot at all that we've ever been able to turn up. So we're relying on uh, a painting again. Whether this is a Herdman, I don't know, but it looks like three tall buildings in a row. Um, that spot there is the corner, top corner of Paddington, where it meets Highgate Street. And um, the top one, which was occupied by Lunce the Bakers from uh, the time it was built right up until 1900 or so, um, is a four-storey building, and the bottom one looks like a five-storey building. Strange that we've never managed to find any um, decent photographs of it, but uh, we haven't, unfortunately. Here's another painting looking across from the other side of Irvine Street, past the corner of the Bears Paw pub, as it was, and this is Paddington here, with number 126 Paddington, the top building built by Williamson on this site. It says number 118 at the top there, but um, the street was numbered several times over the years as more, more buildings were put up. Uh, bread and flour dealers, George Lunt and Sons. And uh, obviously bakery shop there on the ground floor, three stories above may have been flour storage. And as we now know, this uh, very, very deep cellar system below, which we excavated out. Uh, on the other side of the uh, Highgate Street, there's a, another Williamson building. This one uh, was originally, uh, as you can see there, a um, quite a large house. And it had its entrance on the far side and driveway facing out along Wavertree Road up there. But in later times, it was converted. Um, it was turned around, in fact, and turned into uh, two houses, two semi-detached houses with their side by side front doors facing onto Highgate Street. This one uh, had very deep cellars below it as well. And unfortunately, this uh, building came to a bad end when it was gutted by fire and then had to be demolished. And uh, we believe that uh, the whole of the building was demolished and uh, went into the cellars below. So it must have been quite a big cellar system below that one. Across the other side of the street from there, we have um, the corner of uh, Highgate Street and Back Mason Street. Back Mason Street goes just a few yards down there, tiny little back street, and then it turns 90 degrees and comes out onto Paddington again. Uh, this picture is rather uh, interesting, taken in 1934. It's probably the only photograph that I know of that shows just a bit of the Williamson buildings. Looking at the rear of the Williamson buildings, that is number 120 to 126 Paddington. And as you can see, there are very few tiny windows in the rear end of this building. This is typical Williamson. He was doing his best to avoid paying taxes. The tax man was round on a regular basis while he was building those buildings, wanting to know what they were going to be like, how high they were going. And he was evasive right to the end. And he was obviously, uh, he obviously put in uh, plenty of windows at the front of the buildings, but he skimped at the back and uh, only a few tiny windows to keep the tax bill down. Cantankerous old man he was. Um, looking along Highgate Street in the other direction, we have the uh, Bricklayer's Arms, this photograph taken in 1914. And you're looking down there towards Grinfield Street in that direction. <clears throat> this is Mason Street's court number nine. Um, the courthouses were built not long after Williamson's day in 1840 when the population of Liverpool was expanding rapidly. Massive need for more housing and these back-to-back um, -back streets with these uh, tiny two-up, two-down houses were thrown up all over the place. Uh, they became the worst of the worst slums by the 1930s. They couldn't have been much fun right at the beginning. Um, who knows how many people in, in each family. And uh, they all had to live in these tiny back-to-back -back streets with one lavatory and one tap at the end of the street, and that's all they had. They were all demolished in the 1930s at the same time as the Williamson buildings. 
and they occupied this uh, area between Paddington and Mason Street and Highgate Street. That's a rather nice shop. That's St Mary's Church on the top of the hill. Now being renamed All Saints, but I'm afraid I won't accept that. It's still St Mary's as far as I'm concerned. And uh, nice taxi cab rank here. Um, cabbies waiting for fares. This is Holland Place. And uh, I think the uh, taxis probably waited here and carried people down Paddington, down to uh, the city centre. This is a shot taken in 1936. Uh, we're looking up Paddington now towards the top and uh, the street has been transformed uh, quite dramatically, quite a, an important little street now, trams running down it. The trams ran up Irvine Street, uh, past the church to Holland Place, turned round and then ran down Paddington. Uh, neither of those streets were really wide enough to take two-way trams. So that's why they did that. I don't know this for sure, but I'm going to uh, make a guess that um, this could quite possibly be the set of Williamson buildings at the top of the street. This is taken in 1936, and I know that they were still there up to 1939 when they were demolished. So this just could be the Williamson buildings in a photograph again, although it's not much help to us. That's uh, looking down the street in 1952. Paddington uh, goes down there and uh, continues as um, Brownlow Hill all the way down to the city centre. And uh, this tower here should be quite recognisable to most people. This was the Victoria building, uh, the first university building in the city, which is now the uh, Victoria Museum and Gallery. So if you wandered down Paddington at this point, go forward a few years and uh, when you get down towards Brownlow Hill look to the right this is what you would have seen uh, in 1965 this is St Jude's Church and it now stands where the old Royal Hospital is uh, it was lucky to survive obviously because um, there was a fair bit of bombing around here these uh, bombed out buildings are still standing like that way, way off in 1965, long after the end of the war. But uh, St. Jude's Church here is um, rather important to us because it's believed that it was built entirely from stone donated by Joseph Williamson. He supposedly donated all of the sandstone for the building of this church. Um, turning left at this point, off uh, Paddington along Smithdown Lane, which is this one, um, you're faced with Ramsbottom's Chimney, this photograph taken in 1968. Ramsbottom's Chimney was built in the um, 1860s, I think, um, to ventilate the railway tunnel from Edge Hill to Lime Street, uh, which was becoming choked up with smoke uh, steam and fumes from uh, ever increasing numbers of um, trains using the line um, but it wasn't in use for very long it had an enormous great fan driven by a steam engine in its base and the, um, the tunnel passed through under Smith Down Lane right in front of it and um, it was 1885 when the um, the job of opening up the railway tunnel into a large cutting was completed. So from that point onwards, uh, Ramsbottom's chimney became redundant. And yet it stood here until about 1970. Uh, and then it was collapsed. It was quite a landmark. And these flats here uh, were standing until just about three years ago. Uh, there's a, an aerial shot of the same area. This one's quite interesting. These are the four blocks of flats that stood on that site off Elm Grove until um, just about three or four years ago. Um, yeah, no more than that, three years ago. Uh, Paddington Comprehensive School here, which later became the Archbishop Blanche, was built right across Paddington. So Paddington was mostly lost by this point. Ramsbottom's chimney still there. Um, and behind there, this is the drill hole that the Territorial Army put up on Mason Street. And just there 
if you can see it, is that square tower. The only bit that shows of the barracks building, which faced onto Mason Street along there. And behind it, they had their parade ground. And right alongside, these are the buildings that replaced Williamson's house and his gardens. These were put up by PM Williamson's, the garage people, covered the whole of the plot that we now occupy and call the Williamson house site. So not too many pictures showing that. So we'll, uh, we'll just nip along the street and go way back in time again. Uh, this is another Herdman painting. Um, this one supposedly looking over the high wall uh, on Smith Down Lane surrounding Williamson's workyard. Um, I think there's an awful lot of artistic license here, but you can see, obviously, Williamson had this bug for building arches and tunnels. They're everywhere. And um, presumably, Williamson's houses on Mason Street are the ones behind here, although they don't really look correct to me. Uh, I think there's a lot of artistic license there. And we're going to finish off with this one. Looking down from the uh, roof of the police station across Smith Down Lane, this is what the stable yard looked like in the early 1990s, when, uh, or mid 1990s, when the first few individuals who um, got interested in the story of Joseph Williamson and started investigating, climbing in here and groping around looking to see what remained of Williamson's world. And this is what started us all off in the 1990s. And uh, it's what's gripped us and kept us busy for the last 25 years or more. So that's about all I have to show you. Thank you very much.